Ogalinda Davidson of uh, Sierra Leone has been co-chairing for almost 11 years the third IPCC working group, the one which concentrated on questions about whether and how to fix the problems of capitalism. With his background teaching mechanical engineering, including in South Africa, Sweden, Denmark, and the United States, he has co-chaired this group for the past decade and has chaired the approval of seven IPCC reports, including serving as the lead author on two of them. He's joined at his table today by uh, several co-chairs of the mitigation working group, Bert Metz of the Netherlands, who, cha who chaired the uh, approval of seven reports as well, and is, and is a senior scientist in the Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency, by Jim Bruce of Canada, a former deputy environmental minister who was among the pioneers in the World Meteorological Organization to establish the IPCC in the very first place, and he convened its very first meeting in 1988. He served in key roles in editing the third and fourth assessments. So uh, Ogan Davidson will present the uh, program from this third group, the one that looks at how to fix the problems. You're going to give us the answers, right? In 10 minutes, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, colleagues. Let me, at the onset, also welcome uh, one of our co-chairs, Dr. Usun Lee from Korea. I think he should be somewhere in the audience because I saw him, and he should join us in the table. Now, um, we've had the summary of working group one that clearly outlined the science through four assessment reports, and similarly for the impacts and the adaptation for working group two. Uh, what I'm trying to say here is that something can be done. However, it requires other choices. If we look at the series of reports of both special reports and assessment reports represented in this view graph, it clearly tells us that as we evolve in the thinking within Working Group 3, we've an increased our coverage of authorship, we've increased our coverage of knowledge, we've increased our coverage of participation in the world, and this is clearly represented in the tunnel as we see it in this view graph. It's been through a series of special reports, assessment reports, sleepless nights of several authors, of different categories all over the world to produce this important aspect of the technical, the economic, and the social dimension of capitalism. We should not forget that climate change came about with human desires for development, and climate change can be solved also with human desire for development. And as we go through this progression, I'll try to tell you what how IPCC see this great phenomenon can be stressed. Now, if you look at this report, this view graph, sorry, between 1970 and 204 that we measured for the fourth assessment report, significant amount of increase in greenhouse ga gases have occurred, in fact, by 70%. And clearly, carbon dioxide has account for over 76% of that increase. So whatever we do, we have to solve the carbon dioxide problem. And this is what this view graph is telling us. However, if we move along the line, taking where we are now and by 2030, we found out that if you use the scenarios that we've also analyzed within the IPCC process known as the stress scenarios, you'll find out that the greenhouse gases will increase from the most generous to greenhouse gases scenario to the least, which include quite a lot of developmental aspirations as well, between 25 and 90 percent. But that amount of increase in greenhouse gases can be offset by using what we know in economics and engineering, using both the bottom-up and top-down models, using different types of carbon prices, provided we can do it well. It then shows that where can we get these benefits? We can get these benefits in different economic sectors, starting from the energy supply sector, the transport sector, the building sector, the 
industry sector, agriculture, forestry, and waste. This is what is shown in the bottom part of this view graph. But there is one important point. These are due to technical measures, not due to social engineering or lifestyle changes. How can we do it? We have technologies available. But before we, we think about these technologies, let me put it up front, what we are seeing in Working Group 3. No single technology can solve it. It's got to be a port portfolio of technologies. No single technology is enough to stabilize the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And this is where it involves clever judgment for us to see how we use the technologies that we have now in the energy supply sector, how we use them in the, in the supply sector, how we use them in the building sector, and how we use them in the transport sector. Then as you would see that as we progress along the line, there are several technologies that are available now that have not yet been fully matured, but will be fully matured and commercialized along the stream. And by 2030, you will see that significant amount of technologies will be available for us to use, even in the um, transport sector, in the, um, you can see, these are all technologies that will be available and by 2030, most of them will be fully commercialized and they will be on stream and this can help us. But I must say that this is a technological perspective. Implementing these technologies are not as simple as we see. As we know, trying to deploy these technologies is a major, major challenge to us. Now, let us now try to relate what I've said to what Working Group 1 and Working Group 2 have said, especially what Working Group 2 did say in a minute ago. If we're going to get to a situation in the world in which we stabilize the greenhouse gases, we as scientists have tried to ask ourselves the same question, what should be our target to reduce the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere? If we are thinking about 450 ppm to stabilize, you can see the target as suggested between 25 to 40 percent by 2020. If we're thinking of 550, it's between 10 percent and 30 percent. And if we are really thinking which, we, which the way the debate is going on now, possibly it will be difficult for 450. But if we go to 550, then other choices would have to be made. Now, let us view it now in the scientific perspective. What are we saying? We are saying that for us to stabilize, we increase the greenhouse gases to a tipping point, and then we, we increase it, and then we start going down. Now, this is a, one of the major challenges facing us because it would require political decisions. It will not, no more a scientific decision, but political decision. If you look at the view graph, the gray graph shows you that we continue the way we are doing business now, and possibly by 2090, we'll get the tipping point. If you go to the green graph, the two extremes, then we have to get the tipping point by 2020, the latest. As we move along that point, you relate it to the, the, to the um, temperature of the global situation, we would then would have gone way above the two degrees that has been, is hotly been debated around. And we need to start thinking of a world in which significant amount of adaptation needs to take place. And are we ready for that? These are some of the political questions. And you can see that now in the, this graph telling you in the yellow line about where should we pick the, the, the CO2 in the atmosphere. These are decisions that we need to take. If taking them, we need policies, as you would expect. Significant amount of capitalist policies are necessary. One is the research and development. If you look at the trend now, significant amount of money has to go to research and development. The trend is going down. We have more private R&D, but public R&D is decreasing. That requires significant amount of, uh, of investment. Also on new technologies, there are a lot of technologies now 
But the technologies that were available, as I showed, showed you a minute ago, are not enough. The technologies that we have now cannot stabilize the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. You need more technologies. We need new technologies. We need to deploy those technologies. We need tax credits. We need to set standards. And we need to create markets, market creation. Market creation as well alone cannot solve the problem, but it can assist the problem greatly. And also, if you see, look at the previous graph, we talk about different carbon prices. The price, the carbon price has to be set. Clever ways have to be established to, to get the sort of carbon price that we need to do. And we see about linking development and climate change. This is one of the most important aspects of the fourth assessment report. It was the desire for development, that's why we put the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere in the first place. Now we can still change the developmental path and reduce the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So, for most countries of the world who may not even take climate change as a priority, there are several non-climate policies that would solve a problem. One of them is the lifestyle and behavioral patterns as listed, and the others are the policies that we do every day. Macroeconomic, trade policies, energy security, energy access, air quality, insurance policies. These all have significant uh, dimensions in the climate change mitigation. So may I, I like to conclude with this curve, which is the challenge facing the political arena right now. It is left for us to choose which one we want to take. Either we take a developmental path that's high emission base, and then we can all get the seven degrees increase, or we take the low de developmental, path, the developmental path, which in fact still increase our economy, but we do things differently. If we don't, then we can all be ready to be different types of human beings. I thank you. Thank you very much.